Hello. I said that memory is, re is reconstructive, not reproductive. And because we construct information as a memory at the time of retrieval, we often have distorted memories or false memories. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Those times when, because of events that happened in between when an event occurred and the event of remembering, their distortions occur. We're going to talk about first anterior grade amnesia, the ability to not remember things that happened after an event occurred, things in the future. We're talking about retrograde amnesia, what we, when we can't remember something in the past because something occurred, like brain trauma, for example. We're going to talk about false memories, memory illusions, and we're going to talk about eyewitness testimony and how accurate that can actually be, memory for an event that you witnessed or saw in your past. Now, when we talk about interior grand amnesia, we're probably talking about one person. We've already mentioned him twice so far in this course. And that's HM, the patient that had the bilateral temporal lobectomies to cure him of epilepsy, which it did, but create a very serious memory deficit. It, it, he was unable to learn or remember anything that happened after the operation. He could remember things that happened before the operation. By the way, he did have retrograde amnesia. He couldn't remember what happened right before the operation. And as you got further away from the operation, he could remember more. So not being able to remember something that happened after the event is anterior grade amnesia. And not being able to remember things that happened before the event is retrograde amnesia. And he had both, even though if it had occurred further away from the actual operation, he could remember it well. So he had very good declarative memory, both semantic and, ex and episodic, for events that occurred in his past, but not for events that occurred in the future. He couldn't learn anything new. Now, I did mention that he was able to use procedural memories and even learn new procedural memories. Like, he could do the mirror tracing task and got better as he practiced it, even though every time he confronted it, on every day he tried it, he had to be told what to do. He did, never remembered actually doing it, but he was getting better as he was doing it. He was learning a procedural memory, even though he had no explicit memory for the task itself. Let me give you an example of uh, a, a study that actually HM did, or well, we did with HM, present a list of pictures of famous people, but famous in a particular decade. For example, Pictures of Betty Grable and Joe DiMaggio from the 1940s. Pictures of Mamie Eisenhower and Adelaide Stevenson from the 1950s. Pictures of Loretta Scott King and Nikita Khrushchev from the 1960s. Betty Ford, Patty Hearst, 1970s. Geraldine Ferraro and Robert Bork in the 1980s. And if you give that to normal people, their memory actually gets better as you get into the later decades. It's more recent. They were alive during those decades. Um, they, while they might not have been alive in the 1930s, uh, so they remember more of the recent events, except for HM. He remembers things well until the 1950s, where it essentially drops down to almost zero. He can't remember the names of the faces because he do not know who those people are. He hasn't learned who they are. I just want to read something that Brenda Milner was a psychologist from, that studied HM the most, and she reports this in one of her books about a, a statement he said where he just sort of looked up and said this. Right now I'm wondering, have I done or said anything amiss? You see, at this moment, everything looks clear to me. But what happened just before? That's what worries me. It's like waking up from a dream. I just don't remember. So he was aware of the fact that he had certain kinds of problems, anterior grade and retrograde amnesia. Now what I want to do is do an experiment. So get something to write with if you don't have it, a piece of paper. I'm going to show you a list of words, and then after the last word, we will subtract some numbers, and then I'm going to ask you to remember the words and write them down. So get some paper and a pencil or something to write with. The words I'm going to present are up here in the upper left corner of the screen. They'll appear one at a time, and after the last word is presented, I'll ask you to do some subtraction and multiplication addition, simple math problems, and then I'm going to ask you to remember their words and write them down. So get ready. Okay, here's the list of words.
Okay? Now I want you to subtract threes from 417 and say them aloud. 417, 414, 411. Keep going. Now write down the words you remember seeing on the screen. Okay, these are the words that were presented in the list. See how many of them you actually wrote down. I only had 10 words. If I had 12 words, I know that the probability of recalling any one of the words is about 40 to 45 percent. Now, an interesting phenomenon occurred, I hope, in most of you, and that is you recall a word that wasn't on the list, and that word is sleep. Sleep was not presented, but it's often reported as a word that was presented. Why? Because all these other words are associates of sleep. When you remember something, or when you look at a word, you actually encode the word, but also it has association. You, you encode the sort of semantic context of that word, and each one of these words is associated with sleep. So you tend to recall sleep as a memory illusion, a false memory. This was studied by D James Deese in the late 50s, but it really had very little impact on psychology of memory. But then Rodiger and McDermott sort of revitalized the phenomenon when they reported it, and it became a very important procedure for actually the DRM procedure, Deese, Rodiger, and McDermott, for understanding memory illusions and false memories and how powerful they can be. Where you think you saw something, you think you remember something, when it didn't actually occur. Now I want to talk about eyewitness testimony, the work of Elizabeth Loftus has done some really interesting work on the credibility and reliability of eyewitness testimony to crimes. First, she believes, like most memory psychologists, that memory is reconstructive, not reproductive, and that eyewitness to crimes can alter their testimony due to leading questions that are asked in the interrogation after the event. So she has people watch tapes of crime, films, and then she's asked, they're asked questions as an interrogation. They ask questions about what they saw. And then they later, usually a week later, are asked questions about what they actually did see. The eyewitness testimony, those events typically occur. You see something, you ask questions about it, then later you have to report something in the courtroom. Now, one of the questions that she asked in the interrogation was either did you see the broken headlight or did you see a broken headlight? Just one word is different, the or a. And then one week later when they were asked the question about was the glass at the scene, if you said did you see the broken headlight, they're more likely to report seeing glass than if you report, if you ask the question did you see a broken headlight? You can also ask the question, how fast were the cars going when they hit each other, or how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? Different question that they ask about how fast they were going when the accident occurred, but one word uses hit, the other one uses smashed into. And one week later they were asked the question, did you see any broken glass? 
There was no broken glass, by the way. If the word hit was used, 14% said yes. If smashed into was used, more than twice the number, 32% said yes. So asking, just using the, the, the word about what happened in the accident, hit or smashed into, produces very different memories on the part of these people when they were asked that question. The eyewitnesses were also asked the question, did you see the children go, getting into the school bus? And they answer yes or no. Doesn't really matter. Because later, one week later, they're asked the question, did you see a school bus in the film? And if asked the leading question, did you see children getting into the school bus, they were three to four times more likely to say, yes, I saw a school bus, even though there was no school bus in the film at all. Their memory, their recollection, is affected by the leading question. And she shows this over and over and over in many, many examples. Now, this has implications for the courtroom. For example, in 2002, the Center for Wrongful Convictions analyzed then-known 67 different cases where exoneration was made by use of DNA in capital crime cases in the United States. So people, the, the conviction for capital crime was turned over because DNA, DNA evidence did not support the evidence that was presented during the, the uh, courtroom trial. They also found that over two-thirds of those convictions were based wholly or in strong part by eyewitness testimony, questioning the value of eyewitness testimony and identification of suspects in crimes. Elizabeth Loftus has also studied something called the false memory syndrome. It's a syndrome, even though it's not listed in the psychiatric uh, listing of disorders, but it's, it describes a phenomenon where under hypnosis, to sort of help people remember repressed memories, they remember events that happened to them negatively in their past, like child abuse, for example. They remember something under hypnosis that they didn't remember prior to that. There's really very little evidence that hypnosis can change your ability to remember things. And there's a lot of evidence suggesting that in order to solve problems, the reason you're at the psychiatrist, the brain does want to come up with some reason that can help you explain what's wrong. And often that's the repressed memory. I once gave a talk in a classroom that was uh, run by a clinical psychologist, and I said the ability to remember things under hypnosis is an example that we have memories even though we don't have access to them. And she said, you know, I don't, as a psychiatrist, I don't really care whether the repressed memory is true or not. I just want to have something we can target as a cause for their anxiety. False memory syndrome with implications for the courtroom. Thank you for today.